Hello, everyone. Hi. How is it going? Oh. Okay. So, so this session is going to be a little bit different, right? Yeah. But we, we should actually introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Paul. He's Jake. Uh, we work in uh, DevRel. Yes. Now uh, we've been doing web stuff for a while. And it still manages to surprise us, so we've written a quiz that explores the weird and wonderful corners of the yeah. web. But we're also going to dig into the answers and hopefully explain parts of the web, web platform in a way that will help you with your projects and let you build faster, more reliable, progressive web apps. And of course, the quiz itself is a PWA. So prepare yourselves, get your smartphones, tablets, or laptops so they're ready, because we're going to play the Big Web Quiz. Oh, yes. Paul did spend three hours making that one intro in After Effects, by the way. So it's more like six, but whatever. <laughs> Worth every minute. So if you want to play along, and you should, because it's basically the whole point of this session, get yourself down to bigwebquiz.com uh, and log in with your Google accounts. And of course, this is the part where we panic about the server falling down. Uh, it's OK, though. We did test it at Chrome Dev Summit. Yes, and the server fell down. Yes, it did. But I, I think we fixed that. Uh, and with a little bit of luck, it, it should be OK. Yeah, it, it should. But should then fine. your laptop screwed up on this stage last year. Last year, year my laptop broke. But that's a new laptop now. In fact, it's the so, first time I've ever presented yeah. from it. So, so an, it's probably an untested laptop is what you're telling probably me. Probably going to be fine. Uh, has everyone been able to get logged in? Is that sort of thing working? Thumbs yes, thumbs up. up. Oh, we're winning yes. from Chrome Dev Summit. That's just so Sorry, that's I so mean, good. obviously. Yeah, last time we did it, people were just shaking their heads. And we were like, what, what do we do now? We just panic. Just have, oh, a, have a blind on panic. OK. Anyway, we're going to show the top players at the end of the game and at some points throughout, but we only want to do that with your permission. Mm. So if you want to appear on the leaderboard, click on your avatar and click Appear on Leaderboard. Yeah, so if you phoned in sick so you could come here instead, yeah, don't opt in because your massive face appearing on this screen might give things away a little bit. You know. Oh, of course, no quiz is complete without a grand prize. Yes. Mm. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the organizers of Google I.O. told us we weren't allowed to give, have our own giveaway. But we came up with a compromise. Yeah, we said, what if, what if our prize was of such low quality that winning it would kind of feel like losing? <laughs> yes, I mean, if you play the big web quiz, opt into the leaderboard, and use your esoteric web knowledge to make it into the top three, you will become the proud owner of the official Big Web Quiz mouse pad. Oh. oh, yeah. I think we all know he's enjoying that. Uh, uh, we've been asked to make it clear. Uh, you only get the mouse pad. Paul Irish is sold separately. So um, if you are watching this on uh, the live stream, hello. Um, but yeah, and feel free to play along as well. You, you can't win uh, the, the mouse pad, unfortunately. Um, yeah. And there's, there's, a, there's a delay, right? There is. The, the live stream. A, yeah, about 30 seconds behind reality. So uh, you're going to need to watch for the questions appearing on your device, um, as the question may end before the video makes its way to you. Yeah, so in fact, if you're watching this on the live stream now, we've probably started the first question already, uh, because we're going to be doing that in 30 seconds. And you are living in the future right now. Ooh. At Paul, this is hurting my head. Yeah, but it doesn't take much to confuse you, really. So. Uh, no, yeah, Should we do a practice true. question, make sure everything's working? Yes. Let's see if this works. Let's give it a go. So devices at the ready. Here comes the first question. What does PWA stand for? Is it progressive web app produced with Angular, partially wheeled automobile, or perfectly waterproofed anorak? Now, there, there, does anorak, is that a word that's, it's a, it's a coat. It's a coat. It yeah, obviously makes rainbow. it the right answer. Yeah. Uh, the question should, uh, if everything's working, be appearing on your phones now. So pick the answer that you think is correct and hit Submit. Very important that you hit Submit. And while you're doing that, let's see how the results are looking. So what we're seeing here is the percentage of you picking each answer. However, uh, so the, the, the order is randomized depend, you know, compared to your devices. It may not be in the same order. Yes, but we can see that you're all converging on one particular answer. Wonder which one that might be. Ooh, I don't uh, know. Should we close the question? We're closing the question in three, two, one. And there it is. There it is. Oh, OK. So some well, of you think it's are. producive Angular. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, perfectly waterproof Anorak. Obviously, somebody hasn't really thought about it, okay. been to a session yet. Uh, the correct answer is, of course, progressive web app. Yes. 
Uh, so we didn't award points for that question uh, since it's, you know, it's just for a bit of a practice. Uh, but one thing we do want to stress is that you have to hit that submit button once you've picked your answer, else we don't find out about it. Yeah, it turned out that during the rehearsal, some of our colleagues didn't realize that, and they scored zero points. Yes. And in true web fashion, like rather than fix the problem properly, we thought we'd just sort of gaffer tape over it with this slide and just tell you, just make sure you press that yeah, button. Just read the the instructions. So. Mm. Um, so everybody knows what they're doing. So we're gonna, let's get serious now, I think. Yes, from now on, each question will award a maximum of four points. Yes, yeah. indeed. That's a nice, nice round number, number, isn't it? A power yeah. of two. Very happy yeah. with that. Right, OK, so we're going to kick everything off with a deep dive into loading stuff. Because if you want to build a successful progressive web app, you need to minimize the time from the user clicking a link uh, and then actually having your app on the screen and being able to use it. Yeah, now this is the difference between a fast app and a slow app, of course. Mm, yes, so ideally, a progressive web app should load bit by bit. Some might say progressively. Mm. However, some loading techniques get in the way of parsing and painting, and that can result in the browser like downloading loads of stuff, but being unable to show any of it to the user. And then once everything's downloaded, ta-da, there's this big reveal. Absolutely. Right? And that's bad for the user, because they're left staring at a white screen, um, wondering if stuff's downloading, whether their connection is hung. Uh, whereas a progressive render improves the perception of performance, because things can start appearing much sooner. Yeah, and internally, this is good as well, because the browser can create these elements as the HTML downloads, which is much faster than doing like all of the download as one step, than doing all of the parsing as a completely separate step. And that brings us to our next question. Yeah. So devices at the ready. Here it comes. Which of the following script elements blocks the parser while the script downloads? So we have a, a normal script tag there. Uh, we've got a script with defer, a script with async, uh, and a script with async equals false. Now, this is a little different to the last one, because you can select all answers that you think are true. Mm. And you're going to get points for the answers that you select that turn out to be true, and points for not selecting the ones that are false. Yeah, it's actually simpler than it sounds, honestly. You get four points for getting it fully right. You get two points if you get it half right. Yeah, and it might be all of them. Might be none of them. Might be somewhere in the middle. Mm. Also, you can submit as many times as you want. Uh, so if you change your mind at the last second, you can do that. Just make sure you hit the Submit button. OK, let's look at the voting. Don't worry, you'll get faster than this. Let's see how things are going. Ooh. OK, so already we've got a kind of spread of answers. We've got two that you're pretty confident on, two that you're less confident on. You've had enough time to guess, so if you haven't guessed already, guess. But we're going to lock the question closely. Three, two, one, lock it. OK, so what we're seeing here, we're thinking a normal script element blocks the parser, and we're also thinking that async equals false one is going to do the same. Interesting. The correct answer, it's just that one, just the normal script. There's some happy people. There's some less happy people. <laughs> so yes, although it was just a, a multi-select, it was only, only one of them that was actually correct. Uh, scripts are awful by default. They block parsing while they download and execute. Uh, deferred and async scripts, on the other hand, they do not block the parser while they download. Uh, the difference between the two is when they execute. Deferred scripts execute once parsing is complete, and they always execute in the order that the HTML parser discovers them. Async scripts, on the other hand, they execute as soon as they download, and that means they can run in a different order. And you may have noticed async equals false was in the list of options for that last question. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. The browser ignores the attribute value completely. Yeah, so what we're basically saying is async equals false is true. Which I absolutely adore. Yes, well done, web. That is true. Uh, and that's true of most HTML stuff, like Boolean attributes. Uh, they're either there or they're not. Uh, the exception is ARIA, where you can actually set things to be false. True story. Uh, so let's talk about which one of these that, you know, when to use the, the right one, which one is best. OK. So having the script execute in any order is probably risky, because if you've got, say, five async scripts, you've got 120 different permutations of execution order. Mm. And so if your scripts rely on one another, uh, you, you, one of them causes failure, then you don't know where you're at. That's a tricky bug to reproduce and to solve. Yeah, deferred scripts are, are better in this regard because they run at a predictable time and in a predictable order. But if you've got this kind of like a really long article and your script is to enhance a button that's at the very top of the page, it's a big waste of time to be waiting for the whole page to download just to enhance that little button at the top there. Absolutely. So JavaScript execution is always going to block the parser uh, and other JavaScript. So async scripts could actually cause jank during your page load if they're big or complex and they just arrive during the middle of your page load. So, so the answer really is it, it depends. Yeah, really, it depends. Uh, test it and do whatever gives the best user experience. For Turns out users. tools, not rules, is probably a, a good guiding principle here. Tools, not rules. Oh, we should have said, um, at the end of this session, bigwebquiz.com will show a set of links to resources and uh, documentation for the things that we've been talking about, uh, in case you don't believe us or you want to learn more about a particular area. 
Yeah, uh, OK, so we've been discussing these scripts here, but they're kind of, they're old. They've been around for years. Uh, but there is a new way to load JavaScript. Yes. Ooh. Scripts can be loaded as ECMAScript modules, and it's this type equals module thing that, that makes it a bit different. Uh, module scripts can be external resources using the source attribute like this, or they can be inline, like normal scripts. Mm. Uh, the exciting thing you can do with modules is use these import statements to dynamically load scripts. Uh, and this is actually supported in Safari in the, the stable version right now. Uh, but it's also behind a flag in Chrome, Firefox, and Edge. But once it lands in all of our browsers, I think it's definitely the best way to load scripts. Yeah, it it's seems good. really cool. So on that note, here comes a really cruel question. Devices at the ready. Here we go. According to the specification, which of the following scripts executes first? That's and a good quiz voice. Thank you. I've been practicing it backstage in my hotel room. It's been very awkward. So um, what have we got here? So we've got type equals module. Type equals module with something in line. Defer with something in line. And then uh, standard issue script there, but with defer on it as well. Mm, which one executes first? Let's see what you're saying so far. OK, so it's kind of, there's a bit of a debate there's around a, two of the answers. What Let's two of them, yeah. Two of them. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, but it's fairly. Yeah, it's if a, you haven't guessed already, get a guess in. There's no harm in guessing, because we are going to close the question. Three. Three. Two, one, and it's closed. So what we're we saying here, some people think script one is going to execute first, which makes sense in terms of numbers. It's the first number. I like that. Um, that's, that's probably how we actually write our questions. Some people thinking script two, which isn't the first number. No, there you okay. go. Thank you for that, Jake. The, the answer, though, it is script, script three. three. <laughs> oh, yes, someone is very happy at the front there. Yeah. <laughs> OK, here's why that is. Uh, like I said before, the way scripts block execution by default while they download, that was a bad design, a real design mistake. So module scripts uh, have a different default. They are deferred. But the same also goes for inline module scripts. Yes. And this is actually pretty new, because regular inline scripts cannot be deferred. So in this case, the attribute is totally ignored, making it just a normal script, which executes immediately. So it's first. Uh, you can also use async as well on module scripts, and this causes it to execute as soon as all of its imports have downloaded. Now, fetching stuff from the network quickly is important, but not having to fetch it at all is even better. So we're going to take ourselves a dive into some caching stuff. Mm. And there are two basic types of cache usage that we're interested in here. When the page fetches something, it's going to start by looking for a match in the HTTP cache. Sometimes the thing it finds needs validating with a server, so it makes a connection and says, hey, I've got this thing already. It's this old, and it's this shaped. Uh, and the server can either say, no, 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 don't use that. Uh, here's a newer version. Or it sends back a tiny message saying, yeah, you're good to use what you've got. Now, if that happens, the cache sends what it has back to the page. Sometimes, however, the browser makes a fetch. It finds a result in the HTTP cache. But this time, it doesn't need validating with the server, so it just goes ahead and uses it. It doesn't even ask the server at all. And that is faster, right? Especially for small assets where like, just making the request, making that connection is the majority of the work. Now, the primary way to tell the browser how it should use the cache is the cache control response header, which takes a variety of values. A variety. Mm. But do you know what they are and what they do? Because we didn't. No, we did not. Uh, but let's find out if you do. Devices at the ready. Here comes the next question. So this one, what does, the, what does that header, what does that header as a response header tell the browser to do? Does it say, don't put this in the cache? Does it mean cache it, but you can only use it after server validation? Or does it mean cache it, and you can use it without server validation for 31,536,000 seconds, which is a year? Yeah. So, yeah. so let's have a look at the voting, see how we do. Oh, okay. I love it when this happens. 50-50 on two of them. Oh. That's exciting. Some happy, some sad, some confused. It's definitely one answer people are thinking. It's definitely not. So. Should we lock it in? Yes, three, get a guess in if you haven't already. Two, three, three, one, three two, eight, seven, 28, 42. Lock it. Lock it in. OK. <laughs> OK, so you're saying cache it, but you can, uh, you can use it after server validation. Or you cache it and use it without server validation, some of you are saying. The answer? Of course it is. You can use it without server validation. I don't know what made some of you think must revalidate means it must revalidate. You know, yeah. that, that would be weird. Uh, in fact, it does mean that the browser must revalidate once the max age expires. If the browser has a copy of the resource that's under that age, it can feel free to use it without checking in with the server. OK. What about this one? What does 
Same caching header as last time, except that the no cache, uh, we're using no cache instead of must revalidate. Same, yep. same, same answers, answer. same question, just must revalidate has been replaced with no cache. OK. Yeah. Let's have a look at the voting. It's easy, right? That, obviously. Oh, so once again, we've got a sort of 50-50 situation between two of them. Oh, but one of them is, is winning. That's good. I'm seeing a lot of concentrating faces in the audience, which makes me very happy on the inside. Get a guess in if you haven't already. We are closing the question in three, three two, two, one. And it's closed. Right, OK. So we're saying uh, no cash would mean do not put this in the cash. The answer is ooh, cash it but you can only use it after yeah. server validation. I don't know what made some of you think no cache means no cache. Yeah. Yeah, no cache is shorthand for must revalidate max age zero. Uh, so the additional max age we have there is, is just ignored. No cache means the browser may use the cache, but it must check with the server first. We do, no, do not know why they are named like this. It's like they had a load of features and some good names for them, and then they put them in a bag and picked them out at random. <laughs> Well, they do say the hardest problems in computer science are cache invalidation and naming things. And this happens to involve naming things to do with cache invalidation. Yeah, they were destined to fail. Destined so let's have a chat about what we should typically do here then. Yeah, well, uh, like we said, it's best to avoid a request if possible. So for sub-resources, treat your content as immutable. Give it a unique URL that never changes, like we have here, cat4e22, whatever, uh, and let that cache for as long as you can, which is a year. Uh, so if you wanted to update this resource, you would need to change its URL. Uh, there are lots of build system tools that can help with this, one of which is, is Webpack. But you know, Rails and, and uh, Python, like Django, they all have their own. There are plenty of, stuff of them. Here. But not all of your content is going to be immutable. For example, a page like About Us or pretty much anything that the user is going to visit directly. Uh, in this case, it's usually best to use no cache. And that means that the browser will always check in with the server first. However, the page contains like really private data. You can tell the browser not to store it at all using no store, which is actually named quite well. Yeah, it kind of came out of the bag at the right time. Oh, there's no just, store. Let's just look, store I guess. It. Yay! Uh, although, if you've given like an untrustworthy person or piece of software the access they need to read your browser cache, then you, know, you kind of have bigger problems. You know, some people will say it's just paranoia doing a, a right. no store. But there is another caching pattern that we do see quite a lot around the web, mm. and it does lead to some pretty weird behaviors. Uh, because some sites want, want the benefit of avoiding going to the network, uh, but they haven't set up their build system to generate unique URLs. So they go with regular URLs like script.js, uh, and they expect the content to change over time, meaning they don't want to cache it for a year. But they take a guess, and they kind of go, oh, how does how does a couple of hours sound? Two hours. Sounds like a good compromise. But it really isn't. It's a really bad compromise. And we see this everywhere like on a lot of static services as well. Don't do this. Uh, here's why. Let's say you're serving some HTML, CSS, and, and JavaScript, and you're telling it to cache for two hours. User visits your site, and that means they, they download a lot, right? And they end up with those resources in their cache and on their page. So yeah, so, so far, so, far, so good. Yeah, it's all working. But let's say an hour later, you update your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So they're version 2 now. Uh, but you don't change the URLs. Meanwhile, users browsing around the web, and the browser just decides, eh, I've had enough of those two, and it's going to remove the HTML and the JavaScript from the cache. And maybe you're thinking, well, why would the browser ever do that? But the browser can remove whatever it wants from the cache whenever it wants to. Maybe it just wanted some space back. Yeah, and also, uh, because these assets have a max age, and that's from the point they're downloaded, you can get them out of sync. They can expire at, at different points. Uh, so now the user returns to the site. Uh, they'll get the CSS from the cache, because it's still within the two hours. Uh, but the other assets, they are going to come from the network. Yeah, so now you've got version 2 of your HTML and your JavaScript, but you're still on version 1 of your CSS. Yeah, and the result of that, uh, it, could, it could be fine. You could get away with it, maybe. Or you could end up with a load of broken, unstyled stuff appearing Basically, on the page. it's a big gamble. And it's going to be very, very hard to figure out why if it breaks. So don't do that if you can avoid it. Instead, either use no cache or immutable resources with a year of caching. So, so far, we've covered piles of blocking and caching, but another part of page load is timing. Now, some resources start downloading pretty late, and the performance can suffer as a result. The most common one that we see is web fonts, I would say. Yeah. And fonts are defined in your CSS, including how to download them and where to use them. So once the browser has downloaded your CSS, it performs a recalc to apply all those styles to the page. And at this point, it discovers that it needs a web font for one or more of those paragraphs on your page. So it begins fetching it. Meanwhile, the browser lays out the page and paints it. But this paint is going to be missing the text that mm. needs the web font. Oh, yeah, we've all seen this. Mm. And we've all sat there going, really? Really, really? I just wanted to read it. <laughs> um, and it's pretty frustrating, right? But once the, uh, the font has downloaded, the browser performs layout again and paints the page, this time with the text 
using the web font. Yeah, so as you can tell, this isn't really optimal. You know, the font starts downloading so late, and the result of it is the user is left without content. Well, they, they actually have the content on their device. It's just the browser is refusing to download it. Absolutely. Uh, refusing to paint Should it, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, you can improve things a lot using uh, link rel preload. And with this in the head of your document, you're telling the browser that you need the resource as part of loading the page. So that means the download can happen in parallel ooh, with the CSS. Right, so now you can see here the time between the CSS download and the font download is massively reduced, and that means the user gets content quicker, which is now, great. When you use link rel preload, uh, the response is actually stored in a special preload cache hmm, until the browser needs it. So yeah, we've got this preload cache, we've got the HTTP cache, but there is another. Uh, in HTTP2, the browser can like, ask the server for something, and the server can say, yeah, sure, here it is, but also, Here's some other stuff that I think you might need. It sends, this is called HTTP2 push. The server sends down an additional response and the information the browser needs to know for when it can use those responses. Thing is, this cache, they end up, it's a completely different cache from the other two. Which brings us to our next question. Devices at the ready. Which cache does the browser check first? Is it the HTTP2 push cache, the preload cache, or the HTTP cache? This is a cruel one. It's not one I knew until talking to the networking team at Chrome. <laughs> I, think, I think this is bearing out what we're seeing here, which is. Yeah. Well, there's one answer people are kind oh, of yeah, actually, than the others. Oh, it's getting less sure. Now you now. see, there's okay. confidence is waning, Jake. Oh, it's going. Okay. Definitely take a guess if you haven't already. Make sure you hit that submit button. We we're going to close in the question. Three, two, one. one. It's closed. We're out. Oh, the HTTP cache was winning that one. Popular answer. Popular answer among Googlers, I, I seem to remember when we did rehearsal. And just like the Googlers, wrong. Wrong. <laughs> the correct answer is it's link the preload, preload cache. Absolutely. Uh, as you can see, some of these questions are deliberately obscure, so really do not feel bad if you're getting them wrong. Like we said, like Un you're unless you're a Googler who's in one of our rehearsals, in which case you should feel All those bad. Googlers were fired, by the way, so they don't work here anymore. Uh, in fact, if you do end up with a top score, it probably means you didn't learn a lot from this talk, so you've kind of wasted your time being here, to be honest. Unless you say. win the mouse pad. Unless you win the mouse pad. That's a desirable prize. I'm glad they didn't applaud that, because that would have been good. Yes. So yeah, free cash is in play here, and it, it is pretty complicated, but knowing this stuff can help prevent a loads of kind of weird edge casey bugs. So when your page contains a preload element, the browser fetches it as normal through the HTTP cache, potentially to the server, and it ends up in this memory cache that sits alongside the page. So the things to note from this is that your preloaded stuff may come from the HTTP cache, but also since the preload cache sits with the page, uh, other pages will not use it. Uh, they may have their own preload caches, but one page won't use another page's preload cache. Yeah, so that means it's pointless to use link rel preload to try and preload things for another page, uh, maybe the next page, because that page is going to have its own uh, preload cache. The HTTP2 cache, on the other hand, it sits with the connection. Uh, and that makes it pretty different to preload, uh, because two pages can share an HTTP connection, so they can share the same push cache. Uh, things you push intended for one page may end up being consumed by another. Yeah, that's pretty complicated, isn't it? And also, because the server initiates the push, you could be pushing something the user already has in their cache. Uh, the spec does say that browsers can send a message to the server saying, no, stop that. I've already got it. But no browser does this yet. So the answer to the actual question, the question that we asked, the browser checks the preload cache first, then the HTTP cache, and then the push cache. Yes. Yes, that's it. Yeah, that's it. So like you said, it is a good thing to keep in mind. It is a bit out there. But at the same time, uh, if you do find you've, you've got weird behaviors, then it's good to know um, where to start looking. Mm. Yeah, I think HTTP2 push is dead powerful, but it's pretty low level. And in many cases, link roll preload is a simpler, more reliable solution. Uh, and it definitely seems to catch people out less. And dev tools are much more helpful when things are going wrong. Absolutely. So that's the networking round, if you like, complete. Should we take a look at our leaderboard? Yes, we shall. Let's see how you're doing. Mm. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Oi. There we are. Yeah, one person in the lead place. at the moment. Andre in first with 20 points. That's pretty good. But we're only halfway through. Well, Absolutely. Less than halfway, so if right? you've been playing this quiz and you're competing with colleagues and you're thinking, well, they know plenty of network stuff, you know, they've got an unfair advantage, well, hold on. Because the thing is, CSS and rendering, that might be your thing. And that's your time to shine. Mm. Because indeed, 
Let's talk a little bit about rendering. Yeah, animations are important in uh, communicating parts of your UI to the user. And they also just look really cool. We've yeah. had a lot of fun with animations so far here, right? Uh, but a badly performing animation uh, can be really jarring, often worse than no animation at all. Yeah, now modern browsers have an animation fast path known as compositing. And this means that the browser takes a particular element and it temporarily isolates it into its own layer. Now, if the conditions are correct, the browser does this automatically for an animation. Now, this minimizes, minimizes the impact of the animation as the browser doesn't have to keep repainting uh, the thing behind the element that's actually doing the animation. And at the end of the animation, it can merge down or flatten uh, that content back with the other content on the page. Mm. But as Paul said, the conditions need to be correct for this to happen. <laughs> so devices at the ready, here comes a question. We're animating a circle in an SVG. Which of the following animations will be automatically composited in Chrome 57? So it's the center x, center x and transform, transform, or opacity. And you can select, I believe, all that apply. I need to get in on the You the, do. The, I think I like, I, I like your quiz voice. I'll give it a go on the next question. All right, go on. How are you voting now? OK, so Ooh. strong feelings about kind of three of them, less confident with one of them. Ooh, get a guess in if you haven't already. We're going to close the question in three, three two, two, one. Don't forget to submit. There and you it's go. closed. OK, so we're sort of saying uh, we've got a, a transform there. So yeah, yeah the opacity right. and transform. Mm -hmm. The correct answer, Ooh. it's none of none them. them. <laughs> <laughs> it's cruel, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, for implementation and legacy reasons in Chrome today, and I think it's fair to say we'd love to see this change, uh, compositing never happens for elements inside of an SVG element. Use an out-of-date emoji there, Paul. That's not on brand. Awkward. Is it? Uh, awkward. This means your animations are going to paint as a flat single layer every frame. It, uh, yeah, and in case you're wondering, uh, Edge and Firefox do currently support composited SVGs, but Safari 10.1, like Chrome, does not. But the good news is, it, is it's something that we are looking at, and we'll post a link to the Chrome bug at the end of the quiz, so you'll see it in the resources uh, on your devices. OK, so that's SVG. But let's talk about your standard issue DOM, you know, the non-SVG DOM. We are animating a div. Which of the following animations can be automatically composited in Chrome 57? Is it margin left, width and transform, transform, or opacity. Can I commend you on your quiz voice? I really like that one. Oh, it's it's really based cool. on uh, and, and the guy from The Weakest Link in the, in, oh, in the yeah, UK. Okay. Yeah. 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 Let's take a look at the voting. Okay. Similar kind of feel to last time, I'd say this. People are holding on to their previous answers, it seems. Perhaps. But will that pay off for them? It's, it's a bold play. Yeah, should we play it? Three, two, one. And we're closing. There we are. Tricky, tricky. Okay, so we've got the width and transform, opacity and transform, the margin left less confident on. The correct answers, of course. Ooh. Well, pr yeah. Pretty right as a room. That, well that was a good show. Yeah, the answer good is show. any animation that transitions on opacity or transform. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and if you declare the animation up front using CSS and transitions or keyframed animations, the browser can probably move the whole thing away from the main thread. Yeah, and if that happens, the animation can continue jank free even if the main thread is busy. Uh, however, an element that's composited and declaratively animated may still have a frame by frame dependency on the main thread. Absolutely. Now, that correct answer of width two seconds, transform two seconds is one of these. Now, sure, the, anima uh, the element is going to get its own layer if you animate transform. That is absolutely true. But if you animate width, even if you make something have its own layer, you will trigger recalc styles, layout, and paint per frame. Uh, and these are all main thread bound pieces of work. Mm. Yeah, and that's, uh, it's true that things are getting faster uh, in terms of layout and paint, um, or at least phones are getting faster. Mm. Trying to do layout and paint per frame is not normally 60 frames a second fast uh, on a smartphone. Mm. Uh, in fact, layout is scoped to the DOM. So the bigger the document you have, it, the longer it tends to take yeah, in most that's, situations. That's not the kind of thing you typically want from an animation. Mm. So. So the most performance solution here is to stick to transforms and opacity and animate only those properties. Yeah, so just because uh, an element has its own layer doesn't mean that it's safe to start animating properties like left or margin or something like that. OK, let's switch this up a little bit. Let's, let's switch to some event-based animations. Let's get some JavaScript in there as well. Oh, Devices at the ready. Is this your favorite? Is yeah, it? yeah, I really enjoy this one. Here comes the next question. You have an element with no transform and the following code. According to the HTML specification, what happens next? All right, talk me through the code here. What's going so on? So got, we've got a click uh, on click. Um, there's a transform, which translates x 200 pixels. All right. Switch on a transition on transform, 
And then we set the transform to 100 pixels. Does it slide to the right? Does it slide to the left? Does it do the Macarena? Or does it snap to 100 pixels? Let's see how people are voting. Oh, we've got some strong opinions. There's one answer there that people... Well, what's interesting here is there's two answers that are unpopular, and I thought one would have been significantly less popular than any of them. <laughs> Turns out not. Yeah, uh, okay. Get a guess in if you haven't already. Hit submit. We are closing the question in three, two, one. one. How are you feeling? It's locked in. Interesting. Some so people do think it does the Macarena. Snapping I and right. I don't 30, even, that's 13%. That's a lot of people I, who have clearly just given up on the quiz. I don't know, Fair I don't know what to say, folks. Do, uh, put it this way, one of the highest scores we got when we did this in rehearsal was our design advocate, and he was just like, oh, I'm just, I'm just, just picking guessing. random guesses, guessing. and he got one of the top know, scores. I don't even so know anymore. It's pretty good. The correct answer, of course, when it appears on the screen, right, it slides to the right. Now, Paul, I did maths at school, and I was led to believe that 200 is a bigger number than 100. Therefore, moving from 200 to 100 would be to the left. And while I agree with you, you did just say maths. And I think here it would probably be math. I, I don't know. I don't know. I th it's mathematics, so the abbreviation is, is maths, I, I, is my strong opinion. But you know what, America, I could live with it. I could live with it. But then you took that S that you saved, and you put it on the end of Lego. Ooh, Legos. The toy is Lego. Legos is an island off the coast of Spain, probably. I don't know. I'm not a geographist. Shall we? we should, let's move on before we trigger an international <laughs> incident. Ruth doesn't like that. No. <laughs> OK. Oh, so why does it slide to the right, then? What's going on? It's because browsers try and reduce their workload. And the HTML spec uh, accounts for this by saying that a task is queued to run event callbacks. And at the end of the current task, the rendering pass begins. And this is where the browser takes stock of any style changes. Now, by, by that point, that translate x 200 pixels has been overwritten by the translate x 100 pixels. So as far as the browser is concerned, the animation should be from no transform at all to 100 pixels. Mm. And that means when the frame is shipped, it's going to slide to the right. So although the, the DOM layer sees uh, has set the transform to 200 pixels, uh, we overwrite that value before the style system in the browser like, takes any note of it. Right? Yeah, exactly. So what we need to do, if we wanted to slide from the right to the left, is to make sure that 200 pixel transform kind of takes hold before we overwrite it to 100 pixels. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, here comes the next question. You have an element with no transform in the following. It's the same question, really. Same question, but yes. the difference is we have that final transform wrapped inside a request animation frame. Does it slide to the right? Does it slide to the left? Does it snap to 100 pixels? Or does it gain sentience and feel only sadness? Basically, a web developer. Let's see how you are voting. Or less sure this time, dividing the room, uh, except for one particular answer. Wonder which one that is. Mm. Get a guess in if you haven't already. We are closing the question. Three, two, one. It's locked in. Oh, so what we're we seeing here, oh, kind of pretty much equal guessing among the. That tends to happen with this quiz about this point. People just kind of, it all just spreads out evenly among the uh, non ridiculous answers, should we say. <laughs> the correct answer, though, is once again, it slides to the right. What? Ta da! What? Yes. Why? Yes. Tell me. Because. Uh, maybe you're thinking Why? that. OK, Carl. Because we, <laughs> you set the transform to 200 pixels, and you maybe thought, hey, we waited a frame, and then we set it to 100 pixels. So surely it took hold. You know, We got the 200 pixels to take hold, and then we animated. Like, that's what you'd expect. But no, the HTML spec says, once again, uh, things should be a little bit different to that. Yeah, it's the same as before. Our event callback runs as part of a task. Uh, and then we get to the rendering bits of the event loop. And that involves running any requested animation callbacks. And then the browser thinks about styles and such and doing the actual painting. Uh, because animation callbacks happen before style recalculation, the net result is exactly the same before. right? Like we, we overwrite the value before the style system sees it. OK, so let's talk about what we could do then if we wanted to solve this. Now, one fix that we could apply here would be to not call request animation frame once, oh no, but in fact call it twice. Just take that in, enjoy that. <laughs> now, if you request an animation callback while the browser is running an animation callback, then those will run in the next turn around the event loop mm. uh, after style recalc, which would mean that you've definitely got something at 200 pixels uh, before transforming it to 100 pixels. The downside here is that you've got ridiculous looking code. 
and that it would be an extra frame before the animation starts. And in fact, in Safari, you'd actually wait uh, two frames, because they don't follow the spec, though they do follow what I think was our expectation. Yeah, initially, we thought Chrome was buggy yes. in this case, until we, we actually ready. looked at the spec. I was like, mm. CR bug and everything. Ready. And then, <laughs> oh, no. Uh, but perhaps you don't want to do this kind of ridiculous double wrap thing, and instead you want to force that style recalculation to happen synchronously so the style system sees that 200 pixel transform before you change it to 100 pixels. Shall we have a question on that? Yes. Here we go. What could go in here? And by here, we mean where it says answer goes here. Um, to force a synchronous update in Chrome 57, get bounding client wrecked, offset width, get computed style, in a text. Select all that apply. Ah, multi-select one. Let's see how people are voting. OK, Ooh, so we're confident this. on one of them, unsure about two of them, pretty certain one of them isn't. Seems to be what the room is saying okay. so far, though it's kind of rising. We are going to close the question in a couple of seconds, so take a guess if you haven't already. Make sure you hit the Submit button. Closed in three, three two, two one. one, and it's done. Get computer okay. style there being the most popular of all the answers. Interesting. Yeah, but offset the with correct with answer. Mm. Mm. What is it? It is. is. Everything oh. but get computed style. <laughs> Who knew? We didn't. Well, I didn't. You did. Here's why. So the browser starts off knowing the styles and layout for every element. Uh, and you know, because it needed to know all of that stuff in order to, to draw what you saw the, the frame before. Uh, but then we set translate x to 200 pixels, meaning the browser's calculations are, are no longer valid, no longer up to date. And that isn't a problem, because the browser will just like, recompute everything uh, once it needs to update the actual rendering. However, if we call get bounding client rect offset width or inner text, the browser has to recalculate the style and the layout synchronously in order to give you the correct answer. Yeah, so if you're asking for, say, the width of an element, the browser has to figure out what you changed, what the impact of that change is, and then and only then can it give you the answer. Mm, right, and, and, you know, and all of the correct answers cause that to happen. The, probably the most surprising one is inner text. Uh, because like, an inner text actually has a, a layout dependency, because it will, won't give you the text of the inner elements that are displaying none. And it also has some dependencies on, on line layout as well. The problem here is mostly that these are all fairly heavyweight options. Mm. Uh, they trigger both style calculations and layout synchronously, not per frame like in the previous example, mm -hmm. admittedly. Yeah, and since layout calculations, they scale with the DOM size, that you risk pushing the start of your animation back, uh, which may make your app feel laggy. You press a button, you have yeah. to wait a few milliseconds before it, it starts up. Now, what we'd probably like to do is avoid calculating layout, if at all possible. Uh, which we can do with get computed style. And you might have noticed that that wasn't one of the correct answers. Uh, and that's because things are ever so slightly nuanced here. Mm. Because you might think get computed style captures the styles. But no. When it's called, <laughs> you might think that. But not. In fact, it's not. No, because if you update the styles before checking a property of the computed styles object, you'll get the second value and not the first. And this blew my mind when you first showed me it late. The styles aren't computed when you call the big get computed styles function. No, they are computed when you access one of the properties of the object it returns. So to work around this weirdness, you call get computed style, but also access one of the properties, such as, as transform. And in the question, technically, we didn't actually access the transform property. So we wouldn't do, do anything. It. Uh, all that said, we overlooked one option, which is uh, using web animations. And this is a nice imperative API, quite kind of jQuery-like. Uh, it'll do these kind of animations, and it'll make use of compositing and everything. Uh, the problem is web animations, not great support out there. It's basically just partial support in Chrome and Firefox. Uh, and because it's in Chrome, it means you get it in like, Opera and Samsung Internet, et cetera, but not in Edge or Safari. Yeah, so while it is an option, for Compact, you're probably going to use Get Computed Style uh, for the time being. OK, so with both network and rendering people, hopefully fairly happy. But it isn't over yet. Oh, no. Let's bring on the quick fire round. By which we mean the silly questions that didn't really fit into the narrative of the talk anyway. Pretty much. So, it's so just we just want to ask back. them. OK, so our first one of these. Ready? Let's go. When we say quick fire, we mean quick. Yeah, what yeah. happens with foo, min height, 300 pixels, max height? 200 pixels. Uh, will it be 200 pixels tall? Will it be 300 pixels tall? Will it be zero pixels tall? Or will it crash all browsers in a three mile radius? Get an answer in quickly. Three. Well, let's see how people are voting. So we've got one answer that's particularly popular. Hit submit, take a guess, because we're closing the question in three, three two, two, one. It is called quick fire for out. a reason. OK, 200 pixels tall is the most popular answer there. Now, according to the CSS spec, OK, here we go. 300 the algorithm for height is figure out the tentative height 
Uh, and then if it's bigger than max height, reduce it. And if it's smaller than min height, grow it. I have literally no idea what you just said. Fair yeah, enough. I didn't think you did. Right. Uh, it basically means uh, min height always wins. OK, fair enough. Here we go. Let's move on to another quick fire question. After, oh, this is my favorite. Yeah. After running this code, which of the following is set to 1? And you can see we've got uh, an int 8 array. Uh, and we're setting a bunch of uh, items there to 1. So the suggestion here is that possibly maybe one or more of them is not going to work. So select all that apply and get an answer in quickly. Big thanks to the V8 team who showed yeah, us this one. We didn't know anything about it. No, they were um, wonderful. Judging by the spread of answers there, you know nothing about it, so it's fine. We're all friends here. Yeah. That's great. But Welcome. we're locking it in in three, two, one. There we go. OK, right. so bleh, who knows? <laughs> the correct answers, though. Here they come from the server, which is getting slow. OK, there we go. Yeah. Correct answer, 0 0.9 and 1.0. Why? Yeah, the reason is, is pretty weird. Go on. So when you do this kind of thing, when you assign uh, like this with a string, uh, JavaScript needs to decide if you're assigning to a property of the object or if you're assigning to a, an index of the array. Now, numbers are treated as array index assignments, but so are strings if the string is a canonical string representation of a number. Yeah, and when I first heard that, I had no idea what and it meant. I still don't, but okay. I can <laughs> follow So along. for example, what's this about? OK, OK, yeah. Point 0.9 is not a canonical representation, because the canonical representation is not point 0.9. Yeah, this means the browser is going to treat it as a property assignment, and that works fine. Same goes for 1.0, because the canonical representation is just 1. However, 1.1 is the canonical representation of 1.1. So JS treats it as a number. And this means it tries to assign to the 1.1th item of the array, but array indexes need to be integers. So it's just silently ignored. Yeah, just why would it throw an error? Um, so the same goes for 1.2, same and kind there, of deal. Yeah. Right, same second deal. last question. So uh, we are going to move on if my clicker continues to work. There we go. That makes me happier. Devices at the ready, here we go. How many elements are created? Ah, OK, I so we're assigning to inner HTML, then plus equals, plus equals, plus equals. How many elements does it create? 1, 4, 10, or 16. Let's two see how they're notes. voting. Quick fire, so get your answers in quickly. We've got oh. two strong answers, and two people are you know, pretty dismissive of. Guess, if you haven't guessed already, we are closing in 3, 2, 1, and we are closed. So we're saying 4 and 1, the most popular answers of the room. OK. The correct answer, of course is 10. Ten. Hey. Yay. So why is this then? OK, so when you use plus equals, it is equivalent. It's just shorthand for reading the value and adding more to it. It's a read and a write. So if we expand this out further, we create 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 elements. There you go. So there you go. If you really want to append a string to an element, you can use insert adjacent HTML, which is ancient and Apparently, brilliant. I get bounding client rack. Same it, kind of thing. Thank you, Internet Explorer 4, for that API. Yeah, this will actually create four elements. So, we're going to do the final question of the whole quiz now. Device this might be my favorite, this one. Oh, Given we... this chunk of HTML, which resources are requested? So what have we got here? We've got, a, we've got a, an, an image of a source. Excellent. We've got a script of a source. A oh, link rel style links. sheet. Link rel preload. OK. Whoa. So. One, it's two, a select three. many, so select all that you think apply. Yeah, one, two, three, or four. Ah, let's see how the answers are coming in. Interesting, oh. a real spread here. So it's kind of confident, I guess. Wow. wow. Did anyone else see that? I think that we, there is a large amount of bird mess has just landed right in front of us. That is incredible. The birds are not happy with the quiz. Yeah, yeah. Someone didn't pick the right answer in the last round. Fair enough. <laughs> OK, we are gonna, I'm going to start back a little bit. Yeah. And we are going to close the question in three, two, one. There it goes. OK, right. so a sort of spread, spread there of the answers. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, but which ones actually I are going this. to be requested? It's so good. It and is one. Just one. And this question is really evil. And I don't know how many people might have, have spotted what was going on here. Yeah, so even though this is an IMAGE image, the browser does treat it as an IMG image. So yes, that one's going to download. Uh, this script uses source, S-O-U-R-C-E, rather than uh, SRC. So the browser just ignores it. Just ignores it. Doesn't download. Don't like that one. These use the correct attributes. But have you noticed that 
Ooh, yeah, that uh, code highlight has, well, it's basically all but gone. Yeah, Pretty why has it changed? Well, in HTML, script elements cannot be self-closing. That doesn't work. You have to close scripts with a proper closing <laughs> script tag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the browser parses those two link elements as JavaScript, and that's going to throw an error. They definitely don't download. Sorry, that was horrible. Sorry, not sorry. Completely not sorry. <laughs> well, so this is it, uh, the moment we have been waiting almost 45 minutes for. Yeah. Who are the winners of the mouse pad? Let's find out. Oh, Ivan. Oh, Andre. And, yeah, Andrew, Andrew Betts. Andrew Betts. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, excellent. But all three of you have won mouse pads. A big round of applause to our three winners. Um, so after the session, come and find us. Uh, come to the front uh, with your phone and prove that you did actually get that score. Yes. And bigwebquiz.com now shows a set of links uh, describing the detail behind some of the questions that we've asked today. And with that, we, I've, it's been a pleasure. It's yeah. been a blast. Uh, thank you so much for playing along. Thank you, Rex. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.